The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. While this is a pre-recorded show, we are interested in your ideas, comments, and questions, and we urge you to email them to faithmatters at thetalkstation.com. Give me faith, trust what you On the talk station, Faith Matters. And welcome to Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And thanks for joining us here today. And I'm Ben Ball and joined again with uh, Reverend Robert Carnegie, uh, uh, Reverend um, Carl Zorowski with us as well too, and also Bishop Doc Loomis as we talk about what's going on in the news and how it affects our faith. And uh, the, we are, last week we did not talk about this subject because it was preceding the anniversary, but now post the anniversary, the 15th anniversary of 9-11, wanted to start with an article that was an opinion piece that came out in the Christian Post, What America Needs Most on the 15th Anniversary of 9-11. And this was written by Dr. Richard Land. And uh, Robert, you know this author very well. Very well. Yeah, he's president of the seminary I went to, mm-hmm. and um, I think he's the fourth president in the history of the seminary <clears throat> and uh he is he speaks out on these kinds of issues regularly but uh he's an amazing man of god and and um takes you know feels the pulse of the church he uh, he summarizes what happened obviously 15 years ago that we all know and how where he was etc uh and he also then uh, concludes about three four paragraphs in and says all of us remember the rush to attend churches and the solace people found in their faith. Unfortunately, the return to faith for many faded quickly, and within months, we returned to our normal. However, the new normal was different from the old normal with heightened security measures, loss of freedoms, and a significant loss of peace of mind. And on Sunday, September 11th, our Christian leaders have called our, our churches and all Christians to pray for repentance and spiritual renewal in America. I wanted to bring this up because it it was it was in a time uh, with um, uh, certainly Abraham Lincoln most noteworthy. Also, last time World War One during Woodrow Wilson called for a time of prayer, public humiliation, and fasting. Uh, and that call, uh, Robert. Let me just start with you. That call for prayer, fasting, and repentance is rare these days. Publicly, yes. like that, particularly coming from um, the political side of the of the um, of our culture, but, but, but specifically uh, accenting the need for repentance. Yeah, that's a lot right. Of people find you know it's interesting. He quoted Ronnie Floyd, who's the past president of the Baptist Convention, and uh, who who said, you know, um, the church can't call America to repentance until the church repents. And I thought that was significant. I mean, it, it begins with the church. It begins with us. It begins those called by my name mm-hmm. who will humble themselves and pray. And uh, that's where it begins. And then we, by repenting and turning from the way we've been going, and what do we have to repent of is, is the obvious question. It sort of begs that question. Right. Well, wait a minute. Right. We're the church. We don't need to repent. We already repented. Or we're the victims of right. this attack. Right. Well, that's true. Yeah. yeah. So there are. We got plenty to repent about <laughs> in the church. Uh, and, uh, Carl, what do you think of this uh, approach here? About this call for repentance. When I think about um, repentance as a United Methodist, you know, for me, I look at John Wesley's view of repentance, and he taught repentance was an awakening. And, you know, was 9-11 an awakening for the country? Yes, it was. Uh, the events of that day woke us up to the reality of evil and hatred in the world. Um, and I think that, you know, on a personal level, when we talk about repentance, that is where we need to be awakened to a need for us to change. And that repentance comes from God. God's preventing a grace wakes us up. And as far as the church goes... Um, I think the church needs to awaken to uh, her complacency in the world. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when we look at society and we say, how has society moved so far away from God's word? Well, it's because when it began to move, the church didn't say anything. The church has remained quiet for too long. And now uh, the world has strayed so far from God's word, it's harder for the church to bring it back. Doc, what do you think in all this discussion? I agree with Carl. I think the church has been complacent. I think that's largely because the church was kind of all up in our own sin, and it's hard to point out evil and cast out demons when you're filled with them yourself, isn't Mm -hmm. it? It, it, We're at a time right now where we're asking, you know, what should the church's response be to these 9-11 uh, holy days, if you will, or remembrance days, and what should the church's role be in the United States, given where we are. And I think it's the same role that Christ came with, really, to point out evil and to cast it out, to call people to repentance and righteousness, uh, and to go, you know, I, really nothing's really changed since Matthew 28. We're still called to go into the world and preach the gospel, to baptize and make disciples. But I, I do like very much the way that uh, the, what you've said, Robert, reading out of the article, that it needs to be, and I would say it needs to begin not just with the church, but the church needs to call us as individuals to our own personal paths of righteousness and repentance. There's no, uh, there's no way that the church is going to experience a revival until I've experienced a revival in me. There's no way that repentance comes to the body of Christ until it comes to the members of the body. Let it begin with me. That Are you going to sing? Uh, no, I'm not no, going to sing. Okay. You know, but that's, but that's a wonderful go. song, Ben. Yeah. You do it lovely. <laughs> the um, but the quote in here. Let me just uh, say for you to respond, Robert. Is that uh, it says in here? Um, we must always remember that as Christians, our ultimate and eternal security is in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he says, "Let us all covenant in prayer together that God will send a spiritual awakening to our country, and that we will once again be a nation that God can truly bless." Yeah, it reminds me of that that progression, and and I've I've said it before that that um, tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And rather than trying to run away from from and forget what happened on nine eleven, we actually need to go back now because you know what did the when the when israel went into the promised land and they crossed the jordan what did they do they erected stones as as stones of remembrance and they would whenever they saw those stones of remembrance it would take them back to that moment and honestly we have to do that because we forget and that is a that is a was an opportunity for a turning point the direction we were going in the journey we were on that's what repentance means is that you turn and you take you take another course and so the church is the members of the church of course the church is the members of the church so you know what is the course that we're on and we need to examine that individually um before we start look at the bigger picture. Well, as you as you bring up the people of Israel, then and then also so important to them was their history was to be reminded of their history and where they came. What do we say to people who are who are eighteen, twenty years old that have very little memory, personal memory, of nine eleven? What do we say about where uh, where that benchmark is for us as as Americans and as Christians? Carl, what do you think? Well, that was the day that. The world changed for all of us. And, um, you know, as those of us who are old enough to remember, that Sunday following 9-11, yes, the churches were full of people. But I think the attitude was that people were looking at Jesus as a spare tire. Hmm. We had a problem. So let's open up the trunk and get the spare tire out, (laughs) fix the problem. When everything seems to be moving smoothly again, we just throw him back in the trunk because we don't need him. Hmm. And, and we have seen so much change in 15 years. Yes, we have. Uh, that uh, many, much of which we would say is negative uh, in terms of where we slid in our morality and uh, and other things as well too. And and even in our worldview, Robert, I know you talk about our Christian worldview a lot, and our worldview has gotten muddy. 
Well, there's always the temptation for the church to disengage from this messy Mm -hmm. world we live in and to kind of pull aside and create our own little kind of utopian (laughs) place where Mm -hmm. we we just don't have to get our hands dirty and we don't have to get into that. And uh, we separate ourselves from it. And you know, God, Jesus didn't do that. He never did it. If he's our model, we we need to recognize that, Doc, as you well know, we've got to get in the ditch, and we've got to help people rescue the perishing. We've got to get in there with them, that we were there, and somebody helped us out. And so our we have to do that. We, that's a, we are the we are the rescue squad, if you will, to a degree, spiritual rescue squad that needs to go out and and tend to the wounded and the hurt and the broken and those that are suffering. And until we do that, we're just another social organization that meets weekly and sings a few songs and pats everybody on the back and and uh, we're goes on for for another week. So, but the antithesis of that is confession and repentance. Right? It begins, it's got to be personal. Mm-hmm. It's got to be from the heart. That's where it's generated, and it really has to be empowered through the power of the Holy Spirit. We have more to come in a moment here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Welcome back here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Thanks for joining us once again. Bishop Doc Loomis, Pastor Carl Zorowski, also uh, Reverend uh, Robert Cornegy with us uh, once again, and I'm Ben Ball. Let's take a look at another article. This one came out uh, this week and has caused some uh, controversy as the as the vice presidential candidate on the Democrat ticket is, has taken the position that that the Catholic Church might change on gay marriage. The website called Crux, Taking the Catholic Pulse, uh, has an article that says Democrat Vice Presidential nominee Tim Kaine, a Catholic, said Saturday night that he's changed his mind on gay marriage and now supports it and predicted that the Catholic Church may eventually follow suit, among uh, things citing the Pope's famous remark, Who am I to judge? In the article, it says uh, Democrat Vice Presidential nominee Tim Kaine is predicting this. He describes himself as a devout Roman Catholic, as a U.S. Senator from Virginia, former governor of that state too, and he told the Human Rights Campaign in its national dinner Saturday in Washington that he had changed his mind about gay marriage and that the church may follow suit one day. Before we get into the church, what the church might do, uh, let's talk about the changing of the mind thing because that does seem that evolution, as uh, the President Obama called it, seems to be pretty pretty uh, run rampant, I guess, on uh, on that side of the ticket. Uh, Robert's squeaking along there. Sorry. <laughs> it's my back. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, but Doc, this um, this mind change, I, I think we can chalk that up to a lot of political factions of where somebody stood prior to 2008, let's say, and, and where they stand now. Yeah. So this is another guy who's saying, "Who am I to judge?" That's kind of the that's kind of the line that gets whispered around the zeitgeist pretty pretty much that's 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 the thing who am i to judge and uh, of course the pope said it but the first thing we have to remember uh, this is mr kane is that we're really not in a position to judge that is god and he's already judged this and uh, our job is to actually be obedient and follow him i i, I had to kind of laugh a little in sadness when when the vice presidential uh, nominee said that he was a devout Catholic. Isn't the very definition of devotion the obedience to the teaching or the teacher? Evidently not. So, I I mean, to call yourself a (laughs) devout Catholic and then say, well, and of course, you know, it's a little known fact that uh, the Catholic Church has been following the vice presidential nominees for years. 
So, uh, you know, so <laughs> obviously when, when Mr. Kane says, I've changed my mind and I'm pretty sure the church is going to follow suit, he, he's probably got an inside piece of information that we just don't Been have. And sharing that with Joe Biden. Says what yeah, saying. but this is, again, this is just a simple example of somebody looking at, at a thing in this whole non judgment, everybody's equal, everybody, big tent, equality, inclusion. Who am I to judge? And I'm just telling you, Christian people out there, you are not to judge. We are not to judge. God has judged. We are to be obedient to his judgment. Now, the quote uh, from him in this, uh, uh, which is basically just reflecting what he said to this human, human rights campaign, says, for a long time while I was battling, the, uh, battling for LGBT equality, I believe that marriage was something different, he said. Virginia's lieutenant governor, when state lawmakers pushed for a constitutional amendment to keep marriage between one man and one woman, he recalled speaking to amendment supporters who said they hoped LGBT people would... Uh, feel uh, so unwelcome that they would move out of Virginia. When I heard the uh, proponents describe their motivations, it became clear to me where I should stand on this. I don't remember him saying anything about that during that time, uh, but uh, because as lieutenant governor, he was president of the Senate uh, in, in, uh, in Virginia. So he knew a little bit about uh, how the procedures were going. Uh, Carl, what do you think on this? Well, to me, what I hear is, a politician saying what he feels he needs to say in order to get elected. Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, bottom line, that's that's what happens. Yeah. You know, if yeah. if the polls should change on how people feel in the country about same sex marriage, don't be surprised when his position changes yet again, or anybody's position changes. They're going to say what they think people want to hear. And I had a district superintendent years ago who told me that as a pastor, my job was not to tell people what they wanted to hear, but to tell people what they need to hear. And maybe that's what we need in our politicians. Yeah, but that doesn't get them elected, unfortunately. <clears throat> no, no, that will and, not and, get them elected. And, 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 and that's on both sides of the aisle. And there seems to be such a concern about hurting anybody's feelings. And that's not the way to lead a country. Cue, cue music, once again, the song Feelings. Right? Bring that up, Robert. Well, that's it, isn't it? It always comes back to that. You know, and this was to the Civil Rights, what was that group? The uh, Civil Rights Commission? Or human, the, human, uh, human Rights, rights, rights Campaign. Tell, tell me, Ben, tell me a little bit about the Human Rights Commission. Human, Do you know anything uh, human about Rights them? Campaign Campaign. Is what called. So, what, uh, what kind of group is that? Are you familiar with that group? Uh, you think HR. you're broadly, just for all humans, should have rights? They fight and, justice and human rights is what they say. It's, yeah, a, it's the largest yeah. LGBT civil rights advocacy group. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Read that again? It is the largest LGBT civil rights advocacy group. So, and political lobbying order. So, President, uh, Vice Presidential Candidate Tim Kaine was speaking to the largest and a collection of, of the lobbyists. largest <laughs> lobbyists <laughs> yes. for the LGBTQ um, XYZ program. With, so, with revenue of thirty eight and a half million dollars. Yeah, exactly, Carl. You, you, you exactly. You well, gear I mean, your message to your audience. Yeah, and I'm not sure. I mean, as a Methodist pastor, I cannot speak for the position of the United Methodist Church and what the United Methodist Church is going to decide on an issue. That's not my place. I can speak to what the church currently teaches. And with Cain here as a member of the Catholic Church, how can he tell people what the Pope is going to do? Isn't it interesting that, that his appeal is to in to Genesis, the book of Genesis, which right, is right. probably yeah. the worst place he could go to make this appeal and he about this broad Ohio. diversity that God looked at this incredible diversity of humanity and said, it's very good. Well, number one, obviously, he hasn't been to a Bible study lately of the Old Testament because that's not what god did well first of all he didn't say that after he created man at all no. he did it with every other day of creation but when he created man he went eh. <laughs> it needs it's some work there. so then he created the woman yeah. uh, anyway and, and notice that that in chapter two of genesis when when god creates the woman and it says you know that she was taken out of man that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and the two shall become one flesh this happened 
prior to the fall. Exactly. That's right. the point, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That he completely left out he left that original out. sin. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And I, look, I agree with him that when God made creation, it was good. The, the way was good. it was made. The right. way it was made. Yeah. Right. But then we had original sin. We had the fall. We had the rebellion in the human race. And, and the consequence of the rebellion of the human race is the entire creation is now corrupted. Mm-hmm. It's nothing. No it's one is, similar no one, but no different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's corrupted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not what it was. Let me uh, let me uh, segue into another and use Genesis as the uh, as the idea because uh, we have gone from um, talking about God speaking into existence uh, the creation and, and to now people can speak into existence whatever their sexuality is uh, and uh, and here we have uh, in the NCAA coming to North Carolina and saying we're taking all these. Um, uh, championships that are going to be were to be scheduled to be played in North Carolina way because of uh, HB two, uh, which they claim discriminates against LGBT community. Uh, the uh, NCGOP made a response saying that they uh, that's so absurd it's almost comical. I generally look forward to the NCAA merging all men's and women's teams together as single singular unified unisex t- uh, teams. The, the absurdity of, of, of both positions it seems to be evident, I think, in this. That's a great, great point that is made, that, that this is so myoptic, I think is the word. It's The vision is so single on this and so crafted by the NC. You, look, they had their lawyers go through every bit of this. I mean, they made sure that they were able to do this. And so they have... They have um, staked their claim on a on a position that um, is really, a, uh, it, it, you know, hearkening back to some of the terms that we were using earlier. You know that we're in. They've put North Carolina in this basket of deplorables. Deplorables, right? And so yeah. there is a way you deal with a basket of deplorables, isn't it? Yeah. You leave it alone. Yeah. That that's you don't. Don't engage with it. So, Don't engage so, with it. But and the NCAA is is easily is uh, obviously taking a political stance here for this nonprofit organization too. By the way, well, they're taking a religious stance too, yeah. Ben. I mean, you know, we were just talking uh, the last it, last last week mm-hmm. about the government of Norway has a department of religion and sports. And sports. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, so w- th- we do too. <laughs> Evidently, it's the NCAA. <laughs> it's the NCAA, and so they're making they're taking moral religious positions on this on something that really doesn't affect the game, the play of the game. It's not on the field that this is an issue. It's it's back in this. Our churches are having a hard time, I think, understanding well, the the this as even being a conversation. Uh, again, if you go back, if we want to go back to Genesis, we can't imagine speaking through Genesis and saying that this is the way of the world, that this is the way that God created it, and uh, instead of just someone claiming that this is how it should be. Uh, this is uh, uh, Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240, and I'm Ben Ball. We'll have more uh, in just a moment. Welcome back to Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. I'm Ben Ball, along with uh, uh, Pastor Robert Cornegy and also uh, Bishop Doc Loomis and uh, uh, Pastor Carl Zorowski is with us here today. And we, as we talk about some things that are coming up in the news and around the uh, around our world. And let's take a look at this article that comes out of uh, Christianity Today. In their gleaning sections, it says, Sorry, Trump. Three in four evangelicals don't want pastors endorsing, uh, endorsing politicians from the pulpit. 
this goes back to what's called the Johnson Amendment uh, from some years ago. And But it starts out the article, since the 1950s, the IRS banned preachers from endorsing candidates during church services. Donald Trump has pledged to eliminate the ban, calling it the greatest contribution to Christianity if he's elected president. However, most Americans, including evangelicals, seem to like the status quo. Four out of five Americans say it's inappropriate for pastors to endorse a candidate in church, according to a newly released report from LifeWay Research. Three quarters say churches should steer clear of endorsements. For the most part, Americans with evangelical beliefs agree that pastors and churches should abstain from using their resources, including the pulpit, to campaign for a particular candidate. 73% say pastors should abstain, while about 65% say churches should abstain. I'll just say that I had had, um, several weeks ago, I had uh, two two emails in the same week. One of them was saying that they were glad that I did not uh, preach politics from the pulpit, and the other one said they wished I would preach politics from the pulpit. So there may be no satisfying uh, some people on that on that score, huh, Robert? No, no, yeah, no, that's right. It's tough. There are always those that, and look, I, I personally, you know, I'm a very political being. I always seem to have been for a long mm-hmm. time, and uh, so I, you know, have always pushed against what Johnson did in the 50s. I mean, he was being attacked by a nonprofit, basically. Right. And uh, was had the political clout to push through Congress mm-hmm. <laughs> a, a bill, a law, made law that would stop religious nonprofits or churches um, from well, he made it a tax issue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it tied he tied it to the that nonprofit status. So um, yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that's I think that's absolutely wrong. It should be gone. But I think we do have to be wise in the way we talk about political mm-hmm. candidates. I mean, that's just the way it is. Our congregations are not monolithic. Mm-hmm. They're very different, and so we have some are mature, some are immature, some are at different stages of their development, of physically, emotionally, spiritually. Spiritually, yeah. and you have to be able to present a message. You have to present the truth. You don't. You don't. And that's why I talk. I, I tend to preach more on principles and mm-hmm. um, what the word says about truth and why we use that as our standard for determining how we're going to vote or what political party we're going to associate with or any of that. Well, I actually mentioned on the Sunday following getting those on those messages saying, well, we really we preach Christ crucified. That's Correct. number one. And then uh, from there on, you, you are to deepen your own understanding of what the issues are. Uh, and it, it certainly should form you. Uh, but I, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to hold up a ballot and say here's where you check, and say that. Uh, Doc, you, you did I did I wake you up over there? <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> you looked up all of a sudden when I said that. So, <laughs> do we get in trouble for endorsing people on this radio show? No, not at all. Only in the pulpit. Mm-hmm. Okay, well then vote Republican. <laughs> um, <laughs> They, they might have already gleaned that from <laughs> you think previous so? discussions. I don't know. I've tried to be really aloof about all that, <laughs> how I feel. Um, people in the pulpits. I love the Civil War, and anybody who's a Civil War historian knows that there was some of this during the Revolution, but really nowhere was there more pulpit battle over uh-huh. candidates than the preachers out of, particularly Charleston, South Carolina, and Boston, Massachusetts, and New York. They were they were literally preaching sermons and then publishing them in their respective newspapers and mm-hmm. then sending the newspapers down to the to their opposing preacher preaching one side of slavery and the other, uh, you know, at least three major churches were divided over that preaching and, and that's you know, right, mm-hmm. including the Methodists and the Presbyterians, right. yeah. Baptists too, so, Baptists too. So this is something that's a part of our American heritage. Pe- preachers have been preaching on it for a long time. The irony is that it was the IRS regulated that we couldn't do this anymore precisely because of, as we read in the article, the fact that Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was a, a then senator, was running for re-election and a 501c3 opposed him in, in a very vocal way. So when he had the chance, he, he signed a little legislation called the Johnson Amendment. I Personally, I I think it's absolutely fine for a pastor to endorse, but 
as in all things, you know, as pastors, we look to our life and we, you know, we, we pull, we snap that little rubber bracelet on our arm and say, what would Jesus do? And I have actually stayed away from this in my 36 years of ministry, endorsing candidates because there are more important things for me to endorse. And the only candidate I'm really interested in getting elected is Jesus. I just mm-hmm. really don't. I feel like if, if he's elected in the hearts of the people, then it really, really won't much matter who's in the office. Carl? I agree uh, with what I've heard so far. Um, I think if if I decided, which I'm not going to do, but if I decided to endorse a candidate from the pulpit, um, I would probably be presenting my scripture in view of how I felt about that candidate. Mm -hmm. And what would then happen is I would be presenting a skewed view of the scripture, And I might cause somebody in that church to have a skewed understanding of that scripture. A stumbling block. Right. And they they may also feel that um, they're being coerced Mm -hmm. into supporting a particular candidate. You know, for me to stand up and say, well, Jesus wants you to vote for this person. And they go, well, I didn't know that, but I guess I'd better do it if I want to be a good Christian. And that's... That's not right. Mm -hmm. That's just not right to do it that way. And that's exactly what Mr. Cain did in the last story, right? Yes, he did. He he Mm -hmm. took a piece of scripture and used it to support, in this case, not a political candidate, but a a political position. Right. Correct. And And we really are held to a higher standard. We really cannot do that. And the day that I endorse a political candidate from the pulpit is the day that I alienate a part of my church. Mm. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. I'm bringing yeah. division into that church that doesn't need to be brought into That's that exactly church from right. the pulpit. When I ran for a clerk of court, I was asked in a forum uh, about what I felt about uh, separation of church and state, uh, and because they knew I was a pastor. So uh, I, I quoted about the Johnson Amendment, and I, I said a little bit about that. But and then also I said, render under Caesar what is Caesar, and under God what is God's, mm-hmm. uh, and that I don't preach politics from the from the pulpit, uh, but. We do have to understand that the the moral view is gonna is gonna shape that coin that those that the head of Caesar's on one side and 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 God is uh, maybe depicted on the other side. Well, you know that's why I don't do it from from the pulpit. I do it during announcements <laughs> oh, no. because then that's that's not the word of God. <laughs> but no, no, I don't. But what what I do. Preach. I'm going to use that line now. It's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> what I do preach is that um, we should be active in the political, Christians should be active in the political process. Mm-hmm. And the statistics are horrifying. Only 50% of those who claim to be Christian are registered to vote. And only 50% of the registered voters, mm-hmm. Christians, voted in the last election. So we're talking about 25% of Christians are active in their poli- yes. in the political process. Right. And and we wonder why the world is the way it is, why our nation is the way it is. Mm-hmm. We have removed ourselves from the marketplace of ideas. And so we have to do it. And I tell you some some of the Christians I talk to are some of the biggest complainers and crybabies I have ever seen about political stuff. Mm-hmm. And they complain and complain about the political situation and yet they do nothing to change it. And so that's where I get passionate from the pulpit. That's where I talk about that as an American, we are, as an American Christian, we have a, we have a duty, this is what we call that, to, be a, to participate in the process, to be salt and light in our, the culture that God has placed us here. He put us here. He chose us for such a time as this. And it's our duty to act on that responsibility. Mm-hmm. So that's where I come in. Now, as far as which way you go, you know, that's between you and God and your conscience. And I'm going to try to, if you want to ask me what I'm doing, I'll tell you what I'm doing. But um, well, the way I go through that process, but um, that's the main thing is get in the game. And I'll have that conversation about who I'm going to endorse. I'll have that outside of the role of pastor. Exactly. If I am being viewed as the voice of the church, no. If I'm being viewed as the voice of the church, if I have my collar on and mm-hmm. somebody asks me, Pastor, who are you going to vote for? My answer is going to be this. 
I'm going to vote for the person I hope wins, and I pray you'll do the same. Mm-hmm. Well, Trump mm-hmm. is trying to appeal to the Christian right in, in saying Correct. this. But let's be frank. I mean, if, if he were really smart, he would try to appeal to the libertarian. He'd try to appeal to our, lib- our, our, our feelings about our First Amendment right. Because really what the Johnson Amendment does is it, it, it takes away the freedom of speech. And I'm sorry, but regardless of what you think about what happens in the pulpit or what doesn't or what we choose to do in stumbling blocks and all that, the fact that the United States government took away the right of a person in, an, in a 501c3 heading that to speak publicly how he feels about the politic or the person of a nation, I think is abominable. Yes. I think on that level, I completely stand with <clears throat> Trump in that. Yeah. But all the rest of what we said notwithstanding, I still stand with him in that the Johnson Amendment takes away the, the First Amendment right of people. And right now, this government is taking away rights so quickly that you can't even count them all up. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's wrong. This is, yeah. The Johnson Amendment's wrong, and it should be repealed for that reason alone. Yeah, that's right. And it has to be undone. I, I, I firmly agree as well. All right. Uh, and maybe you have an opinion on that as well. So we're going to come back with more here in just a moment here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Faith Matters here on the talk station FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, joined by Pastor Carl Zorowski, also uh, Reverend Robert Cornegy and Bishop Doc Loomis as we talk about a couple of research articles that came out uh, this past week. Uh, both of them are appearing in uh, the at the website worldreligionnews.com. And we have talked on, on this subject off and on in different times. The headline on the first one is 78% of U.S. religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, were raised in religious homes. New research says that religious homes produce the majority of the religious nuns, and again, N-O-N-E-S. The results of new research by Pew come as an eye-opener to a number of religious households. 78% of the religious nuns, which is the ones that say they don't really uh, want to follow a particular belief, they say they were raised in highly religious families. In other words, if you're very religious and trying hard to indoctrinate your child into religious beliefs, the chances statistically are that your child might grow up to hate it and leave religion altogether. Religious households may now have to change tactics if they want to see children growing up as practicing believers. Anyone want to fall in line with that story there, Doc? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Really, it's just like, well, you might as well just give up then, right? Yeah. Why even bother to try with the kids? Yeah. So, you know, eight out of ten of them are gonna are gonna go to church. No, no, no. You you do reverse psychology on them, and so you you let them whatever be you just, do, you don't want to go to this church. It, you turn, yeah, you just reverse. Yeah, them. exactly. Well, this is, uh, yeah, this is a great little piece of. I love when we get these little these little snippets of numbers and stuff like that. Um, But the answer is always people are going to, you know, parents are going to have to change their tactics. Okay. (laughs) So the real reason that young people aren't involved in church that come out of religious households isn't because the parents are using the wrong tactic. It's not because of science. It's not because of peer pressure. It's because of patented hypocrisy. It's because children are not stupid and they look at their parents and they hear what the church is saying and they see their parents put on their nice clothes and go out to church. Then they see their parents come home and drink and beat them and they see their parents cheat and they see their parents file false taxes and they see their parents swear in the backyard over the barbecue pit and they say, (laughs) I don't understand why it is that my parents think this church thing is so important when they don't live it. Honestly, you guys all have worked with youth in your careers. You talk to young people about why they're not in church, and they will tell you. The number one reason is the hypocrisy of the church. But in many ways, I think probably most of us uh, probably ran from the church at one time, too. I mean, that was also part of our... We most, did, but, it's, but when the article says it's because there's a lack of evidence and a preponderance of scientific evidence... Look, if my parents go to church and then they come home and they treat me like Christian parents and they encourage me to be a Christian, if there's Mm -hmm. a testimony in my family, I'm going to grab the place that that testimony's come from and I'm going to want to be there. Even if I step away from it because I'm a dumb kid for a while, Mm -hmm. you know, raise up a child and away go when he's old, he won't depart from it. I'm going to come back to it. 
And it is the testimony of the Christian witness in a home that is missing, and it is the hypocrisy in that same situation that is present that is causing our young people not to come to church. And that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> well, Doc, thank you so much. For, and what, you know, I'm, your opinion of the modern day Christian family is yeah. interesting indeed. The, um, but, but it's true. There's an element of truth to that. I think it's right and it's wrong. I think there is a lack. Kids, what are kids, what are kids always asking? Why? 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 Why do you do this? Why, why do you why do, do the this? church believe why, this? Why? 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 Yeah. And what are the parents most often are not prepared to be able to answer those why questions, and so they have to do the other tactic, which is because I say so, <laughs> or the Bible says so, or the Bible you, says you know, so, or God, or you're going to go to hell if you don't do it, and all right. these other things. And so, you know, we don't know how to answer their questions, number one. Now, most of the questions are, you know, even if you could answer the questions, it doesn't answer the question for them. Mm-hmm. They're really not asking the question to get an answer. They're asking the question because they, they're getting ready to reject, basically, everything that you've said and mm-hmm. uh, picking up on on Doc's theme because you have not lived that you have not modeled what your faith is you know I mean look I'm a big proponent of apologetics and that's learning how to to give to answer those questions to be able to give an answer but the real problem of of our youth and walking away from the church is not because they're not intellectually challenged it's because they don't want to submit to the moral authority of God it always comes down to moral obedience. And generally speaking, you're very few of the intellectual arguments that we deal with in apologetics and defending the faith are the real issue. The real issue is that, hey, I just don't want to do it. But I, It's a volitional issue. But it it's sounds, a problem of like the will. Sounds like those are actually... On the same coin, there is they that, uh, is basically that, are is that is that if uh, they don't want to do this, but in part because they've never seen it modeled, right? They it's, don't. They don't see. Yeah, that's why I say it's both. It. It's right. absolutely both. They don't see it modeled at home, but there's also the problem of the hypocrisy they see in the church. Mm-hmm. You've got people in the church who are uh, supposedly living in this community as a family where they all love one another. And we've all seen the times in the church when the people don't love one another and when people act very badly in the church. And the church gets a lot of bad press these days, too. And that doesn't help, um, you know, attract the kids to want to stay. I think when we we talk about the the home situation, the family situation, um, I don't think there's enough nurturing there, spiritual nurturing going on. What is it that the kids are walking away from? Is it this this uh, thing that's added to their list of chores every week. Wash the dishes, make your bed, go, go to church. church, cut the lawn. Mm-hmm. Or is going to church something different? Is it special? Is it about nurturing and entering into a relationship with Jesus? Well, if in, that's in short, what is it happens, something they get to do? Right, something, something, that something they, they get to do. to do. But once they get there, if, it's, if, if, if the parents and the church aren't working to nurture that child into a growing relationship, then why would the child stay? But if they really got into a relationship with Jesus, why would they want to leave? Mm. In, in this study, it says in the article on this uh, Pew study, it says about 18% of the study groups say they do believe in God, but their own way. Uh, and this number is representative of those people who have left organized religions yet believe in a higher power. These people say they are seeking a spiritual path of enlightenment and believe in rather open-minded practices. This segment of people is on the rise, even as religious people are becoming fewer. Uh, but, you know, and when I see this, though, I also see some other later studies that say that people who go kind of a, their own way are, are more likely, when if, if they return to church, more likely to return to more formal, old-line yes, yes. Uh, churches as well. So I think that's an, an interesting thing. Now, we also have another study uh, that comes from uh, George Barna. Had the pleasure of talking with him about his new book, America at the Crossroads. Uh, but this this one, he says, for a long time, 
Christian youth have been accused of being lazy towards their faith and showing no interest towards religious practices. The religious uh, have blamed slacktivism among the youth for this tepid attitude towards their faith. However, recent reports indicate that slacktivism in church may actually be just a myth. Research by Barna indicates that a majority of youth are actually actively engaged in uh, church activities contrary to common belief that youth are going away from religion. Now, I did say that millennials still are leaving the church, though, in, in numbers, but that the um, that those who are there, especially among the teens who are there, are becoming very active in the church. Uh, and it, it was a bright spot, I think, in what we often see as gloomy news. You know, it's fascinating, isn't it? We talked a while back about a uh, phenomena that's going on uh, concerning as people, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, as they start leaving from from organized religion, they're they're stepping out. They're, mm-hmm. They they want to be for a lot of different reasons. Some for um, want to be more spiritual. They don't feel like it's meeting their needs. Others that you know there are lots of reasons. But but um, what we're finding though is that those that are left behind, if mm-hmm. you will, the remnant, <laughs> the remnant, yeah. those that do stay that they are embracing the the gospel more powerfully and more personally than just this this sort of lukewarm easy believism that a mm-hmm. lot of people find so repelling they're looking for something to char- challenge them and they're finding it in the church and i think this article speaks to that that yes the numbers are decreasing but those that are there are are the ones that are digging into the the truth they're going deeper they, you know they're not a uh, you know a mile wide and an inch deep they're actually plumbing the depths of of truth and and really digging into it so there that is a you know you would pray that we would figure out a way to encourage more and more to do that but that is uh that is the positive side of the coin yeah. I think there's two things two things going on here. One, I think it's a sign that youth are hungry for something that they're not getting anywhere else. Mm-hmm. And the second thing is I believe that this is very much a sign of God's grace, God's preventing it grace. He is already active in the lives of these youth before they're even with the church, maybe even before they know who God is, and he's drawing them towards there. And I believe that's why they're coming. And, and and if we can keep nurturing that, yes, uh, yes. we can keep them, uh, maybe keep them a little longer. Yes, right? yes. And hopefully. Uh, well, thank you for joining us again today on uh, Faith Matters on the Talk Station, FM 107 and AM 1240. We'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. Email your comments, questions, and suggestions to faithmatters at thetalkstation.com. of the talk station.